Dr. Jeff Foster. Dr. Jeff Foster, we're on. Um, mate, absolute pleasure having you on the podcast. Even more of a pleasure to know you right around the corner, so I can just drag you in here anytime I want, though. Anytime I want. Uh, so when you rock up for rugby, next time you appear at the rugby club, just you know, bring a shirt and tie. Well, yeah. not tie. Yeah. Bring some smart clothes with you, yeah. as you are today, just in case. Yeah, I'm not doing a testicle exam just because <laughs> we're here. <laughs> right. Is it fair to describe you as a, a, a GP, a doctor, with a, who, who specialises in men's health? That correct yeah, to say? I think that's a, a perfect description of what I would do as my career now, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Um, why? Why do you specialise in it? Is there a difference between men's health and women's health? Um, I specialise in it because no one else does. Um, so if you think about specialisms in medicine, you've got the classics, you know, you've got cardiology got hearts you got endocrinology so hormones and they're all pretty well defined and weirdly we kind of do have women specialists we've got gynecologists you're never going to get a guy going to that clinic and you've got breast surgeons and and occasionally you might have a guy with a male chest problem but it's very rare and you've got menopause specialists which are clearly female docs as well and then you go blokes what where where do they go and you could say well urology that's that's male anatomy but that's just the anatomy bit, the physical bit. And you've got a bit of endocrinology, maybe they had a hormone problem, but that, that's kind of general. But nobody nobody looks at men as a separate entity and say, what are their overall risks? What are their problems? What's unique to them? And um, it kind of grew organically over about seven or eight years because... What, when, what, what grew organically? This, this interest okay. in, in men's health stuff. Uh, basically, when I started my um, NHS... Uh, partnership in in Leamington um, I was at that point the younger male more athletic doc I'm still athletic I point out I do still it doesn't matter. and you're still um, more male still more well that's relative now <laughs> I'm getting older uh, anyway but anyway so it, it was kind of like a self-fulfilling thing so a lot of like there were, at that stage there were a lot more female docs at the practice and um, uh, guys would come and self-select and say look I, I, I've got this sort of problem could you help me with it and I didn't know necessarily an awful lot about it at that stage. And so you don't, you go ask that specialty and they'd either give you different answers or they wouldn't really give you an answer. And you kind of, I kind of got more frustrated that there was no one I could really ask for a lot of these questions and get a clear plan of what you were supposed to do. So I, I sat in with some endocrinology doctors. I sat in with some urologists, um, sat in with a cardiologist. We did lots and lots of different until I could basically say, right, I know what I'm doing with male health in general and um then it came a bit of a passion off that really why you so but why do you think there's not the equivalent of what women have so women's health specialists why do you think that's not common in why do you think that's not common in the first place it's a bigger question yeah but i think the difficulty is that uh, medicine in general has always been seen to be male-centered and historically medicine was run by doctors uh, that were all men. It was uh, aimed with drugs and procedures that were largely performed based on men, by men, for a male-centered um, demographic. So it was always seen that men were already catered for. So if you develop a system which is uh, historically sexist, then then it's already seen like, well, guys, are, they've already got everything. They've got everything in medicine. Everything is for men. And it's only when you start to pull that apart you realize actually that no, it isn't. It isn't really like that anymore. And a lot of male health has been sort of sidelined to, well, if you've got a heart problem as a guy, you just go see a cardiologist. That's fine. But but the cardiologist is really good at looking at your heart, but may not have that overall picture of going, well, but what, what's he doing in his lifestyle? What Has he got erectile dysfunction at the same time? Should he be thinking the two could be linked? Could he have a hormone problem? And no one does this kind of overall picture. I think largely just out of presumed... Um, or this, this this assumption that somehow that guys are already looked after, but of course they're not. Is it being recognised generally across in, in, the, in the medical profession in, in the UK or in a wider uh, audience that this is a, a necessity? Um, is it? Well, in fact, is it a necessity? Well, it sounds like it is. Well, I would say yes, otherwise I've wasted the last 10 years of my medical <laughs> career. Um, but I, I think it depends what you class as necessity. So you can do all this separately. And you can see a cardiologist for your heart problem and a urologist for your, your prostate and you can see an endocrinologist for your, your testosterone. But, but the results are just not as good. 
And when you fragment, if you take someone's body and you just compartmentalize them into different bits, the result's never as good as if you're able to get someone to look at the picture as a whole. I mean, it's, it's not rocket science stuff, but you just need to be able to understand that a person is a person and not an aspect of that. Um, so I would argue that it is vitally important if we're going to improve men's health. I mean, we've got to remember that guys still die on average 10 years younger than women. And we have, but that hasn't changed for, I don't know, I hundreds mean, of years. It didn't realize it that much. What's well, the most, maybe what's slightly the, less now. What's slightly the less. <laughs> but, but I'm trying to make it, for, for more theatrical poise, we're trying to make this more exciting. But I think the general principle is that, okay, so for example, we know the leading cause of death in men is still cardiovascular disease. And yet we don't really do a lot to really push healthy lifestyles in men as much as probably we should. We know that prostate cancer, one in two men are going to get it by the age of 70. I mean, it's, it's 50, 50%, 50% of men will have cancerous cells in their prostate by the time they're in their 70s. And if you live long enough, if you make it to 90, 100, then it's estimated that every bloke will have some cancerous cells. So every guy at some point in their life is going to end up with prostate cancer if you live long enough. Is it identified though? No, not so it's one in, But this okay. is the point, is that if, well, are we looking at prostate cancer the right way? Yeah, and these are bigger discussions about health in general we're not really focusing on why men aren't doing so well in a lot of it, again it's this assumption that everything is just looked after but it's not guys aren't doing as well on their health in in all aspects as they should do you know have higher suicide rates we have higher in we have lower incidence of depression so lower incidence of depression diagnosed so women are diagnosed more with depression but suicide rates are greater in men and that's because we're not opening up and talking about it as much as we should we spend the wrong emphasis getting blokes to talk about their mental health. And is it not also because we just really, we just better at committing suicide? There is that. Because um, women try it more than men, but um, men succeed more than women. Yeah. Uh, am it, I correct in saying that? Can't, it's, it's the methodology that men pick and they're also more impulsive. So when they go for it, they just go for it. Whereas a lot of women's suicide attempts are also cries for help <laughs> and they tend to choose less violent methods to choose how they're going to kill themselves. So there's really interesting studies about... Um, uh, shooting in terms of suicide. So women, for example, will, if they're going to use a gun, will avoid shooting their face. Um, whereas men will aim for something that's They know critical. it's going to take them out. Yeah. Whereas women will try and do facial sparing and preservation, which often tends to be less life-threatening. Isn't it incredible, right, just on a side note, how fucking different men and women are. We look the same, apart from some features... We are so different. When it gets to that grey matter, it's unbelievable. Coming mm. back. Coming back mm. always amazes mm. me. Coming back. Um, prostate cancer. One in two men will develop, will develop a pro- are likely to develop prostate cancer but, or have cancerous cells in the prostate by the age of 70. Did I hear that correctly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Is there an equivalent, um, is there a, is there, is there an equivalent with that higher rate in women when it comes to cancer or any illness? Mm, well, Just breast cancer is extremely common. How common is that? I don't know. You'd have to ask a breast Surgeon specialist on that question, I'm afraid. I couldn't ask that at the top of my head. Uh, it's not one in two. Yeah, it's not that common. But the, ar- the argument is different, though, because breast cancer in women will always need to be treated and oh, operated okay. on. Whereas what we're talking, and this is the whole thing about prostates and why doing PSA tests is not as good as you'd think it'd be, because a lot of men will have prostate cancer for 20 years. I got a what test? A what test? Prostate is the PSA test. You know, you can go to various charities or you can go to your doc and ask for a blood test to check for your prostate specific antigen, which is a test you can do for prostate cancer. It's not very good. That's the problem. My old boss, who was a urologist, always told me we were really good at catching the kitten cancers, the ones that will never really bother you. But we were rubbish at catching the ones that will kill you off. Why do you think that is? Well, because the PSA test, and we're getting quite specialist already, but this PSA test we do is a blood test that looks for the presence of this antigen in your blood. And as you get older, the level naturally goes up. What is an antigen? Um, are we, are we going to go from prostate or general? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll step back a little bit just to make it clear. So um, as your prostate gets older, um, we release a protein uh, in the blood, which is called prostate-specific antigen. And it, for this case, it's just a protein, nothing more exciting. Um, and this level naturally climbs as you get older, um, the more testosterone you have over time, it just makes your prostate grow, gets a bit bigger, releases a bit more. That's absolutely fine. Um, if you have prostate cancer, then that level can grow rapidly. And suddenly that prostate gets really big and releases loads of this stuff into your blood. But you then do your test and it comes out really high. And you're great, you've got prostate cancer. And that's the theory behind this test. But the problem is it's just not that accurate. 
And the reason is some people just have big prostates, so the level comes back high, but they never had prostate cancer. So they have biopsies and stuff, and they go, oh, no, you're okay. And they go, oh, brilliant, that's all right. But I've had a load of tests I didn't need to do. And worse, if you have really aggressive prostate cancer, like the, the ones that are going to kill you in a couple of months and there's nothing you can do, well, then <clears throat> it actually destroys the prostate so much that the antigen level goes down. Oh, so that you go to your blood test and you go, oh, it's all right. And they go, oh, brilliant, I'm okay. And then actually it Too was much, much worse. Like, yeah. So this is why it's just not that good. The really interesting thing about prostate cancer is that this slow-growing ones are sometimes so slow that the first-line treatment for some of these patients is nothing. And we do watchful waiting. We just look, check your prostate every six months. Um, and we just leave it. Because survival rate at 20 years is still something like 75 80%. Uh, after 20 years, 20 of, years of having this type of prostate cancer is so good... You just don't need to treat. And so you could argue for some guys, they will have gone through really invasive surgery. You have your complete prostatectomy. The whole thing's taken out, all the nerves, everything around it removed to completely remove that risk, which means you now can't have any testosterone for a good five years worth because testosterone could feed it. So what do you mean you can't have any testosterone? <laughs> so but you if you have, your body produces it. No, 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 we, we, we stop it. So we actually give patients anti-testosterone meds if they've had severe types of prostate cancer. Sorry, explain why. Explain why. Because so the remember relationship I said between testosterone and, and the prostate. So remember I said as you get older, your prostate gets bigger because it's testosterone sensitive. So the more testosterone you have over time, your prostate just grows and grows as you get older. And that's yeah. how I old guys have trouble peeing. If you take away your testosterone, then it shrinks down again. But didn't you say you're removing the prostate? In a, so yeah. why are you just... Because there's always a chance. And there's a rem there could be a remnant there. There could be a little bit. So you take away the testosterone and that helps reduce that risk of anything there for even longer. So like cancerous cells still exactly. in the area where the prostate yep. was. And if you give them a bit of testosterone and just that little spark, poof, off it goes and you're back up to uh. local. So you've got to give them that as well. And then you can also make an impotent. So they might not be able to get, because you destroy the nerves. So you might not be able to get an erection ever again. You might make them incontinent. You know, have all these drastic surgery for a cancer that was never going to be a problem. And this is the, tricky thing about prostate cancer it's not that simple yeah see the, removing so the prostate the prostatectomy uh -huh. the prostatectomy that's like pretty simple like generally in terms of how long term the impact of that actual surgery is but then five years of no testosterone that's life changing is it um, not I would agree it's life changing um, and when you get blokes coming in with night sweats and with no energy and man boobs and feeling horrific, and you go, well, we can't really give you anything to replace that. That's quite devastating. So, prostate cancer, pretty important one to keep an eye on, right? Mm. Put in the back of your mind. What's the symptoms <coughs> of prostate cancer? So the whole thing to think about prostate cancer is looking at how you pee. And that's the easiest way to think about it. So we all know that when you're a little kid, you can pee like, across a room, and that flow is amazing. And, and again, it, I, did, I did, and this wasn't a joke, but I did write it in the book, and it was based off when my son and I were at an Indian restaurant in Kenilworth, actually, and he was standing there peeing and laughing at me as he's peeing above his own head. And, he think, and I'm looking down this, like, this, this pathetic dribble, thinking, God, when did, I, when did I lose that? When did that power disappear? And the hilarity of peeing miles away. And I remember being at school, standing two metres away from the arrival, going, yeah, look at that. And then as your prostate obviously gets bigger, the flow gets less because it squeezes the tube, the urethra that runs through it, which is what you pee out of. So it gets a little bit tighter and a little bit tighter. So as we get older, the things to think about are, is your flow declining a lot? So if it starts to bother you where you're getting up at night because you haven't emptied properly, that's a sign. If you feel like you've gone for a pee and you could pee again five minutes later, that's a sign that you need to get it checked. Hesitancy, so you sort of stand at your eye and you can't relax enough to get going, that's a sign. Sometimes dribbling afterwards as well. Now, those are the classic signs that your prostate's too big. And the difficulty is they can also be signs of prostate cancer. We don't really know. And again, it's difficult to say. The only classic thing that would make you really worried that it was definitely cancer, even this isn't definite, is if you had, say, bone pain or peed blood or something really unusual. And that's much more of a red flag. But any of those softer signs that your pee is just getting worse and worse could just be an enlarged prostate or it could be cancerous. So I would say... If it's come on over two years, it's probably not cancer because it's too slow. If it's come on over a month or two and you suddenly think, I can't, this has really changed, then yes, you get that checked quickly. Uh, okay, rapid, rapid. <clears throat> um, you know what 
people are going to be doing now. After Checking their pee or standing two metres away from the urinal. Two, well, not even two metres, see how far they are. <coughs> yeah, so I mean, I don't want to take responsibility for the I clean floor. I'll take responsibility for this. So, if anyone, so people listen to this. If anyone listens, people listen to it. Anyone listen to this, he, when you, in men, well, women can try it as well if you want, but men, uh, see how far away you can pee into the urinal or the toilet uh, and then, and then, how many paces, how many paces, how many meters estimated, and then you need to post online, tag the podcast, tag me, hashtag Dr. Jeff, and um, and and then the figure. So like, yeah, two meters, one meter, or some maniac with a Alabama black snake for like five meters. No, I don't really that. want, I don't want photos. That, uh, that's crossing the line. I didn't, I didn't say photos. <coughs> no, I'm just no, saying. No, we just need the figure. Just, just, just the need the figure. Fine. The yeah, figure. Thanks. Yeah, the winner will get something. I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. The loser gets a cross to text me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it, we are doing... This is a health screening. Yeah, no, you're not, right. Are this we not doing a health screening? Yeah, yeah. I've got gloves and some gel in the bag. And there are people who are going to be doing this, realise, oh my God, that is not very far, and maybe yeah. go get checked. Hang on a minute. Have we just saved a life? We potentially have. We potentially have saved a life. Excellent. Right. Prostate. 50%. That's crazy. Testosterone. No. This was a big black hole knowledge gap of mine until very recently, and it probably still is a massive gap. But after reading and listening to your stuff, because I've listened to some of your interviews and stuff as well, Thank you. I am very proud to now be able to correctly memorize and recite dihydrotestosterone. Just that, just that word, just makes me happy. Talk to me about testosterone. One of the questions that come up, I'll ask it now because I'll forget otherwise, and I'll probably come on to it later on. I want to cover diet off later on as well. Is um, uh, testosterone, in fact, you know what? We will come on to it into diet actually. Testosterone supplementation and snake oil charmers and stuff like that. But testosterone, how is testosterone a health issue for men if it is at all? Definitely is. Um, so. <clears throat> we naturally produce testosterone in puberty, obviously, because that's what makes you become a guy. And I think most people in society are familiar with with the word testosterone, and they're familiar that it's a kind of a masculine thing. And largely, at around between 12 and 15 in guys, you start to get a secondary spurt of this stuff. You do actually get a really small amount of it. Younger, but that's, that's not important. During puberty, you get a real surge of this stuff, and then it develops your secondary sexual characteristics. So... It makes you get pubic hair, it gives you a beard, it makes you tall, it makes your muscle mass come on, it changes your voice, and gives you all those classic things that make you a guy, just in a similar way that estrogen kicks off in women and makes women typically female in their appearance. And the two are relatively similar, they just work in different ways. But they're both sex hormones, and they both have these um, changing effects on the human body. And we see in trans patients that you can affect the way people... Uh, 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 are built physically, but also mentally, by changing the hormone profile of that person. Really? So on on the mental front, it can change. Oh, God, actually, it makes sense. Actually, yeah, because yeah. yeah, because obviously hormone has an impact on neural endocrinology and yeah, it's, it's okay. enormous thing. I think there's an, a, a big um, uh, assumption that somehow the sex hormones are specifically testosterone, not just a physical thing. But loads of patients with testosterone deficiency have um, brain fog concentration issues they're grumpy irritable they don't feel happy and the biggest thing you lose with low testosterone is that oomph that drive you know that thing that when you wake up and you go yeah i'm going to take on my day or i'm going to do something and really that drive to do stuff disappears without testosterone and that's entirely mental because there's lots of receptors in your brain for it so so the classic things associated with te testosterone deficiency are um struggling to get a bone on for example or um, what's the what's the word? What's the word? Uh, uh, Gynecomastia? Is, is that a breast thing you're doing? No. <laughs> I don't know what that no, is. No, horny. Horny, oh. what do you call it? Libido. 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 <laughs> right, yeah. I, I thought this was like, am I doing no, a man no, boob no. thing? I libido. Libido. Yeah. But it sounds to me like the most, of the, most of the indicators of low testosterone, potential indicators of low testosterone, are not, uh, there's, there's much more than just those two things. Yeah. So, yeah. brain fog. How, why is that then? Why, why brain fog and what was the other one? Lack, uh, lack of focus, is it? Yeah, lack of focus, irritability, depression, all this sort of stuff. The amount of guys you get that are told they've got depression and they get given antidepressants when actually it's hormonal is massive. We had loads of patients coming like that. 
So to go back to your other point, you, you increase your testosterone in, pu- in puberty, it climbs and climbs in your 20s, it peaks at 30, and then on average, it goes down by about 1% a year. It just reaches peak and it's natural decline as you get older. But the problem is not everyone goes down by 1% every year and you can slow that down or speed it up depending on what you do in your life. So 1% is an average, isn't it? Yeah, it's an average. Um, and in addition to that, it all depends what your starting point was. If you were lucky and you had loads of testosterone when you were 30 and it drops by 1%, well, then you might never cross a threshold of knowing that it was dropped until you're 90. Well, you might not notice. On the other hand, if you were naturally somebody who just didn't produce as much when you were 30, to lose even a small percent might be enough to tip you into that symptom of feeling rubbish again. So um, it doesn't take long. And that's why we see patients as young as mid-20s, right up to my oldest patient who's 89 or 90 now. I mean, he's he's having a very good time on testosterone replacement. But Is he sexually active? Very. At mm. 90 years old? Mm. Oh, my God. That's incredible. He, has, he has a great time. Yeah. Has he got a wife? Or is it? He has multiple partners. No. And a velvet suit. I mean, that's not a good advocate. Does he have a velvet suit? Really, he has a velvet suit. <laughs> um, you know, in a way, I think, wow, that's weird. And then I think, man, if I can do that when I'm 90. That is incredible. Yeah, so, yeah, he's done really well. Anyway, sorry, I'm digressing a little bit. It's fine, it's fine. Um, no, on, <clears> but in terms of the way it works, I guess, so testosterone is, is a is a neuroendocrine hormone as well. So it's still, it has receptors in your brain. And, it, and as a result, it then alters the way your brain processing works. Um, so you classically hear, and again, the, I know we say men and women are different, but when it comes to hormones, we're actually quite similar. And when you talk about women having menopausal uh, absences of brain fogs and feeling like they don't know what's going on, sort of thing, and the similarity with men with testosterone is just remarkable because they, a lot of them will come in, they don't have libido, they still get erections, they still can have sex. They may not have it as much, you know, because you don't have sex as much when you're 40 as you did when you were 20, um, normally. But these guys will just say, well, that's actually not so bad. But the problem is I just can't get through my day. I'm having to have like eight coffees just to concentrate at work. Or I just don't care. Or, like, sometimes you get them in there just like, I just don't care about my job anymore. I'm just lost interest. And it can be that subtle because that's the early sign that things are just starting to drop. So mm. it's important. There's, there's metabolic stuff around testosterone as well, which, which is medically more important. So, for example, we know that low testosterone causes increased risk of high blood pressure, increased risk of type 2 diabetes, increased risk of cholesterol, osteoporosis. Why, um, is, why is that? Because why, why it's metabolic. So if you drive your system faster and you make it work harder, it becomes more efficient and your vessels become more elastic. Your heart doesn't have to do as much. You're, you make, you, you, if you have more muscle, you use up stuff. So it, it's better for your blood pressure. It's better for your cholesterol. Um, and if you make it all slow down, everything's more sluggish. So and then the good sign is that people don't do as well in the gym. If you're low in testosterone, everything's harder. You're like, if you train well, you want to be sore the next day. You want to grow your muscle. Brilliant. Whereas I've got the guys with low testosterone being like, well, five years ago, I could train really hard and I was gaining. And now I'm doing the same work, but I'm just stagnant or I'm just fatter. And that's a sign that it's dropping because you can't get that level. Um, the testosterone impacts muscle growth. Massively. I mean, I'm sorry if I'm being a moron you and, and anyone listening. Well, going, of course it does you. We know that. We Explain at, that to me. So look at um, uh, anabolic steroid use. Yeah. which is effectively just testosterone replacement off license. So these guys are taking a drug that directly stimulates. So anything that's anabolic is causing growth. And in particular, if you can select that anabolic process, you can select it for muscle and that's muscle growth. And that's what testosterone does. That and growth hormone. Growth hormone is a whole different matter and you certainly don't want to be touching that. Yeah, see, I thought testosterone, the reason for the people who take it for, you know, I don't know, you know, the... Uh, bodybuilding or or all competitive sports or whatever was not because of it it promoted muscle growth but just but you could work harder because you were just you were just more energetic if you like you can it does that as well but it's but also a whole lot yeah Mm. so if you you find that people that do have high levels of testosterone can train hard and recover more quickly and see the benefits of their training much more quickly. Um, and that's, yeah, that's true. Anyway, so the point of this all being is that you get all those m- metabolic effects and all the physical stuff we know it's important, but it's not seen as as important in medicine yet, largely because they're all softer things. So 
those changes we talk about, like blood pressure and cholesterol and stuff, well, they're slow to change over time and they're gradual and they're not for everybody. Whereas it's a lot cheaper in the NHS just to give someone a statin and say that'll get your blood pressure down, say um, cholesterol down, rather than make you go through the whole process of testosterone screening and treatment and lifestyle, etc., etc. So not always the best thing. What's a statin? Statin is a tablet that reduces cholesterol. Oh, it's convenient. It's not great. Why is that? Um, one in ten patients have side effects. So uh, bad side effects. Uh, muscle aches and pains, which is oh, a problem. That's nice. So it's really hard, and the statins are really. This is another whole side of things, but we don't know how much high cholesterol really causes heart disease. So you then, a bit like the prostate thing, you have to ask yourself, how many people am I going to treat to reduce their cholesterol and may give them side effects for a problem we, they may never have? We, we don't know. So, for example, if you've had a heart attack, then Christ, you need to be on a statin because we need to get your cholesterol. We cannot risk this happening again. But if you've never had a heart attack and you just had high cholesterol, well, then what are the odds of you really having a heart attack due to that risk? Okay, so... Uh, am I right in saying that sp- the reason for that is because it's not how high the cholesterol is, it's how it's the condition of the arteries and how the how likely the cholesterol is to stick to the artery wall. Am I getting that right? That is indeed Fuck. right, Doctor. Get in there. Yeah, well done. Get in there. Can we come on to cholesterol for a minute? Yeah, sure. Right. I feel like this <laughs> is your, you this your area of specialty. <laughs> no, no. I read it in the book somewhere. Okay. <laughs> I wonder what book that was. Probably um, a very good book, I'd imagine. Right, cholesterol. Let's dig into... I'd like to dig into that a little bit, okay. please, because I, I think... I even see it with my kids. So the, a real misunderstanding of... Uh, well, around cholesterol. Is it good? Is it bad? How it works? How it affects heart disease? And and also, um, cholesterol and how that word is connected to fat in food. Yeah, yeah. Can we do this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah? Oh, let's do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Let's start with cholesterol. What is it? What does what does it do in the body? What does does it do to the body? So, so we actually do need cholesterol, and um, cholesterol is really important because it's a it's a precursor chemical that makes lots of other stuff. So you can't make your hormones, for example, without. So you can't make testosterone without cholesterol. Um, and you can't make all your other stuff that you need, like, you know, thyroid hormones and cortisol and all that sort of stuff. So you, you need it. Um, and it's a, a vital part of what we have in terms of fat in general. The problem is that um, we don't live in a world of Neanderthal man anymore, where your access to fat is extremely sparing and rare. We have an abundance of it. And the other problem is because evolutionary wise, um, fat was so rare to get because, of course, you'd have to kill a saber-toothed tiger to get your fat, which was quite difficult to do in those days because the teeth and stuff, you know, so <laughs> pretty hard. Um, and the so, guns were small. And the guns, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it was all, all tough times. If that and you're killing your dinosaurs, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, so you go. So it was rare to get fat. So your body craves the stuff. So when it, it gets some fat in you, you love it because your body's like, I need this stuff. So it's almost like an evolutionary drive to get as much fat as you can. Of course, now we have loads and loads of fat. So, um, unfortunately, humans are quite disingenuous. <coughs> and when if you were to run a, uh, a multinational food company, then you want your food to taste great. And if you want to make money, you make your food taste great by adding fat and salt and sugar. Because those are the things that evolutionary-wise we crave and we need. But the problem is we just have way too much of the stuff. And when you get too much of the stuff, well, then it overflows. And you have two types of... Um, we, we classically have good fats and bad fats. And there's HDL and LDL. And these are actually proteins you get in your blood. HDL is high-density lipoprotein. And this stuff actually takes the cholesterol in your blood, takes it out the way and shoves it into your liver. So it's, it's out of the system. And that's great. So you want lots and lots of HDL. That's really good. LDL is the bad stuff as we refer to as bad cholesterol, and that takes it out of your liver and f- puts it around in your blood for you. Now, at an early stage, obviously, you'd want some a bit of a balance of both because you might need a bit of cholesterol today to make some hormones. But you wouldn't want too much, and that's the key. And the problem is when that ratio of how much you're eating versus how much you can produce to get it out the way becomes wrong, well, then it starts to flow around in your blood, and that's when it starts to stick to stuff, and that's when you have problems. Why does the liver want HDL? 
It doesn't. Uh, but if you've got too, you, you you've got to remember that from an evolutionary standpoint, you're not going to have access to fat on a regular basis. So you want to be able to store it somewhere so that when you need it, you can release it. And that's the point of HDL and LDL. So that you want to have a, you want to kill your tiger, eat as much fat as you can, store it in your liver. And then over the next week or two, until you get your next kill, you want to release a little bit when you need to. And it to gets released sure. as LDL. Uh, uh, no, LDL takes it and releases it into the blood. LDL, these are just carriers. So um, flick the switch, HDL goes on and it grabs all the cholesterol and puts it in the liver. Flick the other switch, LDL gets released, takes it out of the liver and does the job for you. And takes it in the cholesterol blood. out. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I think I'm getting that. But cholesterol is a mix of LDL and HDL. It is. And there's more types than that. There's triglycerides and all these other sides. But basically, the core principle is that you've got a big wad of total cholesterol and then you've got an HDL and LDL and they take bits of it and put it away or take bits of it and put it back out again. And that's it. Okay. And so when we're talking about bad cholesterol in inverted commas, it's not actually bad cholesterol. It's LDL not doing what it's supposed to be doing. Exactly. Or there is just um, too much. So all good fat, even if it's too much, is still bad fat because you just don't need that much of it. <clears throat> so how does cholesterol cause heart disease then? Or how is, what is its, um, what is its uh, function within heart disease? So you are basically spot on, Doctor, in terms of your previous definition, in that if you have a smooth tube and the cholesterol flows along it, then it doesn't make a difference. Within the blood, through the yeah. artery, yeah. If you've got a tube that's damaged and it's fissured and it's creating a little hole and it's not a smooth line, then little bits as it flows past can get clutched up until eventually it causes a dam effect and that's what the cholesterol is doing. So. What causes the artery walls to get fucked up the biggest so you've got th we've got these weird things called modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors the non-modifiable ones are things you can't do anything about G genetic age getting older you can't okay. really stop that <coughs> and being a bloke which you can stop but that's a major lifestyle change okay go on. so uh, that's the issue so we're going to assume that you can't alter those for most people um in which case the next biggest modifiable risk is blood pressure and that's the biggest thing you can do in your life to reduce your risk of heart disease. Because if the pressure in the system is less, I mean, it's just basically plumbing, isn't it? If the pressure in the system is less, something's not going to blow. Uh, and it's that simple. So these tubes, if there's not any pressure in them in your arteries, then, then they don't get damaged because they're just blood flowing nice and smooth, no issues. So one of the causes of those artery walls becoming compromised is increased or can be increased pressure which basically yeah. stretches them more which makes which so it tends to be them. where you get a bifurcation where it splits so if you've got an artery and it moves to form two more arteries of course you get a little like a branch a little branch yeah. yeah and where the pressure hits the branch that's where it starts bang 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 if you do that over there's years more friction oh, and, it, and it's bigger okay. pressure it could bang something like that. and there's a little tear just tiny tiny little tears enough and then of course that extra cholesterol that shouldn't really be there it's flying past, flying past it, and a tiny little bit sticks. And once a tiny bit sticks, it's like when you're a kid and you're trying to dam off a little stream. Once you've got a couple of rocks on, it makes it a lot easier to get the rest of the rocks on. But the first few are really hard. But once you get a few moving along the line, you can really dam up that stream, and that stream is your coronary artery. And all the rocks stay together easier because they're exactly. in a bunch. That is interesting. Okay. That That's probably the best metaphor I've done for that in a long time. Well done. So thank well, you. excellent, excellent. Um, Okay, that makes I understand it now. Okay, so let's let's um, let's go just quickly onto food briefly. When I think cholesterol, I think oh, you need to be aware of saturated and unsaturated fats, and then every time I think of those, I get confused which one is the good one. <laughs> So when we talk about cholesterol specifically, what yeah. do you really want to be avoiding? I, I think there is far too much emphasis on spending time at the supermarket reading the label and trying to work out which is what because I, I, I not only do I not have the time, I just don't have the impetus to do it either. I just think I've got better stuff to do than read the label on the back of every packet to look at the different types of fats. It's almost like an inhibitor for people to actually pay attention to what. Okay, so um, what should you do? So then? what I tend to think about is, in gen, this is a really broad assumption around fat in general. But if it's nice, it's probably bad for you. Is the easiest way to think about it. So cakes, biscuits, um, chips, anything that's got a processed fatty content to it that requires butter or uh, oils or big things to 
to create that flavor is probably not going to be good for you. Um, and that's that's the principle. If and it's that's it. It's not really that complicated. Um, because even if you're not sure and you think, well, maybe I should look at, you know, ha- have I got enough um, rare olive oil in my Mediterranean salad or something? Well, I don't care. If you're having too much of it, it's still the wrong thing. And that's the point is that with fat in general, it's about the amount you take and not having too much. And it needs to be in moderation. And that's the key. The obvious one is sugar, right? Just cut. Fucking cut down the sugar. That's the obvious one. Is that the obvious one? So obviously sugar is not fat. Oh shit. So you got not sugar. The one. See what I mean? Sugar. This is why you're in you. Yeah. <laughs> so you got carbs, protein, and fat. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. And obviously sugar. And the sugar is the enemy at the minute. Everyone hates sugar because oh, well, it's sugar that's making our population. It must be sugar that's making us fat. We'll come back onto this in it's the diet not. bit. But, but so yeah. so what's the obvious one? Cholesterol. So the, the way to think about cholesterol is that generally. If you think you have three meals a day, most, most of us have three meals a day, and you might have a snack in between, you should really only be having a small amount of fat that involves significant amounts of processing, significant amounts of buttery or oily or um, other fat-based produce. And it doesn't really matter where that source is so much. So, for example, you can have a handful of nuts, really healthy. You know, these are unsaturated. They are healthy fats, high in omega-3, 6, and 9, that kind of stuff. But if you have too much of it, it's still bad for you because there's bucket loads of calories in nuts. So it's still better for you than eating a sausage roll. But if you can't tell that eating a sausage roll is less good for you than eating a handful of nuts, then I feel we're really hitting the bottom end of nutritional knowledge anyway. Okay, we're going to put Most it back. Most people we're gonna will know. We're hope, gonna come, definitely going to come back on the diet, right? But I just want to, yeah, we're definitely come back on the diet because I've got, I've got a million questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> good. <laughs> I'm just writing down there. Sugar is not a fat, you fucking idiot, here. Right. Um, okay. Erectile dysfunction. One of the things that I found really interesting, not because I've got symptoms, really interesting when I was reading your book, Erectile dysfunction. Can we go over that for a minute? Yeah, please. So, yeah, let's start with that. Why is that an issue for men? How common is it? So the fact that you have to give this caveat of saying, I don't have it, is exactly the issue we have around erectile dysfunction. Because guys, won't, won't, they, they, you don't want to talk about it. How many... Have, have you ever known... I'm talking about it now. Well, I know, but I mean <laughs> in a more... Fra- <laughs> so you you would never... And at least personally, I never have gone to the pub with some mates and one of my mates has gone, I'll tell you what, I've got real erectile dysfunction. But what is it? What is erectile so, dysfunction? So erectile dysfunction is des- defined as the inability to get an erection that's decent enough to perform a sexual activity that you would want it to do. So it doesn't have to be penetrative sex, but just to be able to have sexual function of whatever you would deem as appropriate for you. Uh, and it's one in two men will have it at some point in their life. So from age 20 up till dead, um, you at some yeah, point 50%, 50% yeah. of men will have yeah. some form of erectile dysfunction now not necessarily chronic not long term but enough that they will not be able to perform in some way in their life so it's enormous but we so the, the not scope literally, of, otherwise the scope it wouldn't of, be ED yeah so the scope of what we're talking about here I'm assuming is from for example not being able to get a hard on at all through to be able to get a hard on but not be able to maintain it exactly yeah right. and it's anything in between it's the whole uh, spectrum of that sort of problem yeah What's the in-between? Well, it might be a, a reasonable quality erection, but not enough to be able to have penetrative sex. Mm. Or it might be that you can get an erection, but it's only lasting for a minute or two. Or it might be that uh, you can't ejaculate. Or there's, there's different elements around it. But that's why the definition is just that whatever's happening down there, it's not enough for you to be able to have the activity you want to do. With 50% of people going to be affected, in the, in the, well, men be affected, probably, in their life with this, what's the youngest age you've seen this start at? Uh, my youngest patient was 22, 23, 20, 22, 22. Jesus, that must be worrying. Um, for the it, it was extremely worrying for him because he was old enough to know what it should have been because he had great erections in his late teens and then it suddenly declined. So, um, yeah. Talk, can you talk through that case? Well, he had a pituitary tumour, so that was an easy one to pick out. So he actually had a brain tumour that caused it. And his brain tumour caused him to release a female hormone called prolactin, which is the breast milk hormone, um, and that suppresses testosterone. How is he producing a female hormone? Well, we all produce it. The difference is that we produce very, very little. 
and women produce a lot more when they go through pregnancy, obviously, um, and the tumour produced the hormone. And a brain tumour, the, the, one of the symptoms was erectile dysfunction. Was that the only symptom? Um, he had that and he had headaches, and that was it. Jesus Christ! Yeah. You'd never link those two up, would you? But he didn't need surgery, amazingly. It was all treated with a medicine. Because of this type of pituitary tumour, you can just shrink it down. So he's done really well. Okay, yeah. what else? Um, th- th- those, are only, those are his only symptoms. No, I mean oh. erectile dysfunction. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. Um, so the vast, the vast majority of people will not have that. I mean, that's rare, obviously. Um, the biggest thing, in, if you think under the age of 30, the biggest cause of it is anxiety, and it tends to be psychological problems. It's rare to get ED. Under 30? Under so. 30, okay. yeah. Um, <clears throat> there'll be performance anxieties, expectations, um, issues with new partners, that kind of thing. And that confidence thing, you know, that you get as you get a bit older often affects the younger group more. Um, and then as you get over the age of 30, other things start to impact and they tend to be more medical problems. And that's when we classically talk about testosterone again, because testosterone is synonymous with a good erection. You can't get an erection without testosterone. It's just, it's not going to happen because you need testosterone to drive the erectile function. It just doesn't work. Um, so obviously as your levels drop and that's the more slow onset. So guys may just come in in the thirties, forties or fifties and go, yeah, I didn't, I didn't notice I can't have sex anymore, but it's just my erections just aren't as good as they were five years ago. Everything's just a bit more of an effort. Uh, sometimes they go, I, I love my partner, but I just don't, I can't be asked to have sex. I just, I'd, I'd be happy just not to bother. Um, then the vascular ones, the other one that's really common is heart disease. So going back to cholesterol point, and this is really interesting because the artery of the penis that supplies it, the main arterial supply, is almost identical to the artery that supplies the heart, the coronary artery. So it's the same size, same caliber, same type of lining. So we always say to patients, if you can't get an erection and we don't know why, then it's heart disease until proven otherwise. Because whatever's happening down there is happening up there as well. There is on average a three to five, win- three to five year window between the onset of erectile dysfunction from narrowing a vessel before you have a heart attack. Holy shit. Yeah. So if you're, if you're sitting at home going, not, hopefully not listening to me, but if you're <laughs> sitting at home going, I can't get an erection, <laughs> that, that's a weird conversation. Um, that's a different podcast. <laughs> so if you're sitting at home and you go, I can't get an erection, um, and you think, I've left this a while, and I've got good desire, I want to have sex, but the erection is just rubbish, then you're literally a ticking time bomb until we know. And that's quite important. That is fucking worrying. Mm. That is fucking worrying. Um, And that's why I've got this massive um, thing against over-the-counter Viagra. So you can buy it now, obviously, can't you? It's Viagra Connect. You can go to the chemist and you can buy this stuff. Um, And you can buy it. But but this is awful. This This is delaying... Because if you can buy it and it helps a little bit... You don't bother going to get checked out. Exactly. And you're delaying that time, delaying that time. And and that's really unsafe. Um, and even you can get online doctors and online pharmacies where you just have to fill in a questionnaire. And if, you're, if you want to avoid seeing a doctor, you're not going to answer all this stuff going, well, yeah, I have got a history of blood pressure. Or, yes, my dad had a heart attack at 60, but I'm just going to leave that. Because you want your medicine. So you just kind of go, well, I'll just take, no, 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 no. Then I can have it delivered and you get your Viagra. Brilliant, I've done that. And I've spoken to a doctor, but you didn't really... You just ticked all the boxes on an online company. Then it comes to your house. Next thing you know, you're years down the line. It's not a lot better, maybe a little bit better, but things are still getting worse. And meanwhile, that tick, tick, tick's happening. And Maybe you're not yeah. even, even realising it's, it's any any worse because you're fucking masking it before I go and getting a hard on when you exactly, need to get exactly a hard right. You're like, yeah, no yeah. dramas. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fucking hell. I, I, I mean, I've got real... I started swearing. Got to drink a record under function. I started swearing. I, I did see the severity. <laughs> it's I, quite... I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, I, did, I hadn't realised that with the Viagra piece. You know, how many people rely on Viagra and how much of a problem is that because not getting checked out. I didn't... And then linking it to heart disease. Fellas, yeah. if you haven't used Viagra, go and get, Viagra, go and get checked out if you haven't already. Like, I think if yeah, you've ever you. bought this stuff over the counter or from a chemist and haven't spoken to a doc about it first, then have that in your head to go, have I really done this in the right order? I mean, you wouldn't, you'd never do the same for... So as we said, um, you can buy a tablet that will help you pee better, but it might mask your prostate cancer. No one's going to buy that. They want to get... They sure haven't got prostate cancer. <laughs> That's a good point. But because yeah. it's erectile dysfunction and it's a really sensitive issue for guys, they will do anything. My average time from the onset of symptoms of erectile dysfunction before they see me is between one and two years. So guys have waited over a year 
before they'll do something about it. And that's just, it's just unsafe. There's so much you could do. So, yeah. And the worst thing is it's almost all treatable. It, like, I don't think we've had a single patient that we haven't been able to help in some way. They used to talk about, oh, you have to inject the penis. Or this sort of, We don't do that stuff anymore. There's loads, of, there's, there's loads of treatments out there that are really effective. And as long as you actually see a doc who knows what they're doing in men's health and erectile function, then you can sort the stuff out. But please just don't buy it over the counter. Have just you ever injected a penis? Uh, yeah. yeah fr- uh, treated a guy who fractured his penis. Oh, my God. It's in the book. He cheated on oh his my wife. Oh, God. Um, so he was a... Talk through this uh, He was a... Um, he obviously didn't have his rect- erectile dysfunction before that, did he? No, he did afterwards. He? <laughs> he he was a guy that w- uh, was married to a larger lady originally, and his wife got into fitness, and her body ch- shape changed massively, and she became super fit, which was very admirable, except not for him, because he had a penchant for larger ladies. So he started cheating on his wife, with a very large woman and would go out at lunch breaks and cheat on his wife and they'd go hire like a hotel. So I can't remember exactly where it's like a travel lodge or something. I can't remember. Or other hotels also available, obviously, <laughs> uh, for cheating on your partner. Disclaimer. Partners. Yeah. It's not a travel lodge. Um, and any any uh, cut price room is, is doable. Anyway, <laughs> so he's lying there and his, his now uh, mistress is on top of him uh, and with large body mass goes up and down, up and down goes up, comes out, and then comes down again. Um, and unfortunately, that combination of uh, enlarged weight and his compromising position caused the penis to fracture. Now, you would think you can't fracture a penis because, of course, it hasn't got a bone in it. But actually, it's due to the fact these little, when you get an erection, uh, blood fills into these little pockets, which dilate and then cause a hardness, and that's what causes the erection. Uh, and you can still snap that. And that's why it's an emergency, because, of course, if you don't drain that blood out pretty quickly, that blood clots. And when that clots, it dies when that part of the penis dies. And if that happens, there's no treatment. So this guy had the uh, end third of his penis amputated. The last thing he told me on the way to being taken to theater was, don't you tell my fucking wife. As he then gets driven off to theatre. When he's going to be diffy, a third of his penis. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think they had a great relationship anyway, so it wasn't... wasn't I'm going pulling his fist because I... I thought I recognised you! No, <laughs> yeah, no, no. Okay. I... <laughs> previously have... Oh, I'm assuming now it's a fracture. Oh, okay. Okay, okay fine. I, I didn't know where you were going with that, no, but it was yeah, about to become yeah. really and, uncomfortable. Um, and uh, I was very fucking drunk. And um, a similar mechanism of injury yeah. happened. Similar yeah, yeah, yeah. Mechanism, mechanism of injury. And, uh, uh, yeah, fucking basically, it like, it went like 90 degrees it, or more. But it went, no, it went, it went, the, the pain was yeah, the they say indescribable it's, pain I've ever felt. Yeah. It went instantly when it was black, instantly, yeah. instantly. It's called an aubergine sign. And then, and then they, like, just that carried on. And then the, the next day, when my whole pe- my entire penis is black, like the entire penis is black, the, the pain was excruciating. Waking up in morning glory was excruciating because I, I think that was still happening. Oh, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. But when I would get an erection, it was fucking excruciating. I never got it checked out. Wow. And now I'm realizing you were really that. Lucky. And that bloke lost a third of. Yeah, that was yeah. a long you time ago. You were really lucky. A long that. time ago. I, I'm the, realizing the, how lucky the, I am the now. The classic sign, it is, it is called aubergine sign. Where I've got a photo the, somewhere. The, don't. I'll show it to you. The, the put, I'll, I'll put it on the podcast. On the podcast. Go on yeah, iTunes. It's, fine. <laughs> it's, it's that purple discoloration you get that shows there's been significant trauma. Yeah, it was. So my, you I, were really was, lucky. Yeah, I just realised. Jesus. Wow. Well, you dodged a bullet there. I did dodge a bullet, yeah. Holy shit. Um, what was that? What were we talking about there? Oh, erectile dysfunction. Mm. <laughs> okay. Okay. My main takeaway from that little section there was blokes who are taking Viagra or needing something they haven't got the docking doctor go to the doctor exactly go to the doctor yeah yeah I, I think if you, c- you you can do so much to improve it and taking Viagra is like taking a paracetamol for a headache it'll it'll make it feel better for a bit but it doesn't really fix the problem and you can fix the problem so so why why put up with it it's just getting past that stigma of going oh god it's a bit embarrassing I've got to go to the doc about it but if it makes you feel any better 
if you were to come speak to me about it, I would say around three quarters of my conversations on a daily basis are about blokes that have got problems with their penis. So three do, quarters, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. In a men's health clinic, you you always ask those questions, and amazingly, even if they don't come in with it, a lot of blokes will go. Yeah, actually, it, my reactions aren't quite as good as they were. Or, but quite often uh, you don't... Re- I think part of the thing is, quite often you don't realise until you're asked about it and you have to yeah. pay a conscious... You have to consciously think, oh, actually, yeah, X, Y, Z. Yeah. Like even there's little things you're saying here and now and I'm, and I'm it's making me think about my own self and just analysing and going, okay, that, this, that, 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 that. Yeah. And, and people with an issue, they don't realise sometimes they've got an issue until... Totally. Conversations like this. Biggest one to think about is morning erections. That's the question that always gets them. I mean, it's more testosterone than ED, but they, they do like... But if you say to your patient, do you still get morning erections? And if you sort of look at them and go, yeah, but like how often do you get them? Once a month? You're like, no, that's not right. Well, what's the reason for a morning erection? Testosterone. So yeah. okay, you get, you get um, normally, you get about six, seven hours sleep. Um, if Ideally, we want you to have six, seven hours sleep. Once you hit deep sleep, so you're getting four hours of that deep sleep, then it triggers your pituitary to release a hormone, a precursor called LH, which then goes to your balls and releases the testosterone. So you get morning erections because testosterone surge occurs in the early mornings. Now, a lot of blokes will go, yeah, but I wake up, I need to pee, and I've got an erection. So it must be because I need to pee. It's not. You had the erection anyway, but because you wake up to pee, you notice it's there, and that's the difference. Okay. So morning erections are a sign that your testosterone function is normal. So you should be getting them. Um, and you won't, I mean, you know, yeah, like when you're 15, the wind changes and you get an erection. That's fine. But, and you shouldn't, you shouldn't be getting that at 43. Um, but um, you should still have morning erections. And if you can't remember the last time you had one, then that's a sign. And so, like you said, sometimes it's asking those questions. It makes you sit back and think, God, yeah, I never thought about that. Because it's so slow. It's so progressive. You don't think about it. This is fascinating. I'm enjoying this chat. I'm enjoying this chat a lot. Okay. Come on, it's something that is less less likely to kill you, but may make you miserable. Boldness. Uh, yeah. Can you stop boldness? Can you stop yourself going bold? You could stop it completely if you wanted, but it would be quite drastic. So, so boldness is caused by, as you rightly said, dihydrotestosterone. Uh, sensitivity really so the more receptors you have to this dht the more likely you are to go bald where does dihydrotestosterone come from dihydrotestosterone is an end pathway of testosterone so you you release testosterone testosterone this is where endocrinology gets really tedious because nothing is simple in medicine ever testosterone just doesn't stay as testosterone and it it converts to various other forms like androstenedione and dihydrotestosterone and estrogen and all this sort of stuff. So it all gets split and they do different things in the body. And dihydrotestosterone is quite commonly found in hair follicles and your prostate. So the two of them are actually the same receptors, which is really weird. Um, The more receptors you've got, the more sensitive you are to the testosterone you've got as well. So the idea that bald people are more virulent isn't really true. Virulent? As in... Um, they've got higher libidos. They're oh. more masculine. Okay. They've got you know. So you look at the class. You look at the bald uh, Hollywood actor, you know, and you're thinking like The Rock and Bruce Willis, and they must be so masculine. They must have loads of testosterone because they're so manly. And then you think, well, actually no, because you got Danny DeVito as well, and he isn't like your best example. <laughs> so, I reckon he's quite um, sexually active. He, actually, he's a probably <laughs> that guy's probably amazing, isn't it? Jack Nicholson. Yeah. Okay. Forget yeah. it. Bad examples. Um, <laughs> but the point is, that it's not the amount you've got; it's how sensitive you've got to what you've got is the key. So if you've got no DHT receptors, you can have bucket loads of testosterone and you'll be the most masculine guy in the world. Um, You won't go bald. If you've got very little testosterone, but you've got an enormous amount of DHT receptors, then your hair's going anyway and you might still have low testosterone. That's just really unlucky. Um, Interestingly, there is a link between beard hair and hair on your head. So if you're going bald, you're more likely to be able to grow a better beard. The magic is, the magic mixes the two. So some people, and this is the, the rarity, can grow a really good beard and still have a full head of hair. And that's the DHT perfection ratio. Mm. See, I mentioned this to a friend of mine called Gaz. And I said, I said that exact thing. I said, because I was impressed with myself, dihydrotestosterone. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I said, people who, um, see what well, I say with people who um, are prone to male pattern baldness, 
they are quite likely to be able to grow a mega beard. DHT is, is responsible for, one, going bald, two, growing a mega beard. Mm. And his response was, well, that's fucking bullshit, because I'm going bald and I grow a shit beard. Yeah, you can just be unlucky. Yeah, yeah he's unlucky. that's really unlucky. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's a generalisation, obviously. But the, the, the principle is the same, that they're both... The DHT receptors encourage different types of hair growth on different parts of the body. And interestingly, it's not that you lose hair on your head, but it becomes vellus hair. So it changes the hair quality and the hair changes from thick, coarse hair that you can see to basically like downy baby hair. So you do still have it, but it's super fine. Um, and that's what makes you go bald. No, there's, there's, there's people with no hair. Yeah, but if you look at it, the hair follicle is still there. Oh, it's, it's, it's microscopic. It's it's fucking, microscopic. It's called vellus hair. It's like the kind so of stuff you So it just fucking breaks babies. off when it yeah. gets through this skin. So you never really see gone. it. It's yeah, functional. Yeah. But, yeah, uh, yeah. but it's true. And it's interesting that it's the same receptor you get in the, uh, in the prostate. So, for example, if you, you can give people medicine to stop them going bald, and you give them finasteride, this tablet that reduces the effects of DHT. It's, it's an aromatization thing. But basically finasteride? It's, it's called finasteride, and basically it blocks part of the pathway so that that DHT receptor remains untouched, effectively. But it also shrinks your prostate. So we give it primarily to people with big prostates that need their prostate shrinking down. Um, and it has the same effect, because it's the same receptor. Reduces the likelihood of male pattern baldness. Yeah. So if you've got a big prostate... And you're having trouble peeing, but it's not cancer. So it's a different thing. So not cancer at all. But if you've got a big prostate because you got older, we give you finasteride. Your prostate gets smaller. <laughs> your hair's probably going to get better as well. As in, it'll actually improve yeah. in growth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Finasteride. Yeah. There's people writing this down now. But it's never that simple, obviously, because there are side effects. And the side effects are we are still blocking part of your testosterone pathway. Nothing in, nothing in, as I said before, nothing is ever that simple. You want your testosterone, and usually the male pattern one is quite well tolerated because the dose is low, so it's lower than it is for your prostate treatment, but it still has side effect risk, and it can still cause man boobs, it can still cause erectile problems, um, it can still cause ejaculation problems. So, so it's always a trade-off of what is the best thing to do, but in general, it's a good tablet, it works. Can we... Ejaculation problems. How? So what's so how? Well, remember, it still acts on your prostate, and your prostate is required to generate an ejaculation. I don't know. How it's, I don't know the, how it's. I don't know how it works. So the prostate, when you ejaculate, the prostate squeezes, and it helps produce some of the erectile force you get during ejaculation, and it also helps produce some of the the process of ejaculation and orgasm itself. So if you remove some of that pathway, it's not as good. I didn't know the prostate was responsible for that. No, true story. <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> cool. Okay. Anything else you want to cover on the on the baldness? Yes. Uh, oh, okay. It is, Sorry. It's not always male pattern. Is the other thing. So you okay? Biggest thing then. I don't know if you want to go into the snake oil side of this stuff, but there is so much you can buy for yes, male hair treatment, yeah. and it's almost all complete bollocks. Go on. So there, it's re when it comes to male pattern baldness, and I'm not talking about the stuff that's not male pattern. So if you've got fungal infections, stress response, uh, trauma, any, anything like vitamin deficiency. Because you can lose patches of hair, can't you? Exactly, you can, yeah. You and we're not talking about that. So if you've just got classic male pattern hair loss. Which is? Uh, it's called androgenic alopecia, and you get hair loss that starts at the tips here slowly crawls back you start to lose a bit on your crown and eventually the two meet together so the top of your head's bald and the sides of your head's got hair yes yeah, so you get the wraparound yeah, effect yeah, and that's yeah, the yeah. classic male pattern picture um if if you if you have that then there's really only three treatments and it's really simple nothing and i really stress there's nothing you buy over the counter except for one thing will make any difference and that's all regain or rinoxidil and that's a spray or foam you can get and you don't need a prescription for it and the way it works is we don't well, actually we don't really know exactly how it works, but it dilates the hair follicle and it improves the hair quality and quantity you get on your head. And it works and it's I'm good. Spraying it on. It's spray it's, it's a foam and you rub it into your hair. It's really good. Regain or rinoxidil? It's a minoxidil is the drug Min name. Minoxidil. So minoxidil was actually a blood pressure treatment that they developed about twenty years ago. Maybe it wasn't that now. Um, and they were trying to reduce the blood pressure. Um, and it was rubbish at reducing blood pressure. But what they found was these guys were all getting hairy. Um, so we found actually if you use it in a topical form, it works just as well. So you, you can It's interesting it. the minoxidil because unlike the finasteride, it's not impacting your 
DHT exactly. or yeah. your, testo- or your testosterone. It doesn't. It's so just anyway. topical, and it's, just it's, topical. it's amazingly successful. The downside of it is that you've got to keep using it, of course. And as soon as you stop, your hair goes back to whatever it was before. But for the time you use it, it's great. And how quickly does good. it have an impact? About three months. So it takes three months to start to use it, applying it every day to you start to see some growth. Yeah. But it pocket gym works. It does work. What are the side effects? Topical irritation, maybe. It might irritate your skin, but that's it. It's really good. In fact, there's interesting a couple of studies, not many, but a couple of studies that show you can improve beard growth as well with it. So you rub, it on, you, you rub it on your so face. You could rub the foam on your on your face if See, you try to go better beard. That would help my mate Gaz. Rub it on his head, maybe. on his face. The trouble with beard is it all depends on how many receptors you've got. If you just don't have enough DHT receptors, you can rub what you want on it. It's not doing anything. So, but it might work, and there's some studies that show it does improve. So, so apart from minoxidil, yeah, everything else is dog shit. Everything is a complete waste of time because nothing is going. To, so, there's a lot of oils you can buy. I don't really understand what hell an oil is going to do. Beard oil market is huge. It is. Yeah, it, it does nothing. I mean, it literally does but nothing. It, it can change the, the visual the appearance. Look, it can't it change yeah. the look. Yeah, but that's not <clears> the actual hair. I mean, the hair that's on your head and on your beard is dead, so you can't really do anything to that. What you're trying to do with any medicine is change the follicle that's alive underneath and what that does to the hair. And that's the important thing, but there's nothing you can buy. So all these things that are called like men's health shampoos or um, I can't name the companies, but there are a couple that will offer like all in one uh, tonics and treatments you can put on your head to improve hair. They don't, they don't do anything. Yeah, there, there's no studies that show they do anything. So just don't, don't bother. So you take, you can use topical minoxidil. So regain is that. You can use. So, sorry, regain is one brand. That that's the minoxidil. only brand I think. It's still oh. got a trade, so that's why you can say it because I don't think there are any other alternatives. Okay. You can get a generic minoxidil that comes just as a spray, but you have to get that as a. You, you can't buy that. If you just want to buy it over the counter, it comes as regain. There's no other companies in the UK that will sell it, um, and you can get it from Boots or anything. Um, anyway, so you can get it from those. Uh, other one is finasteride, which is the tablet we talked about. But you have to get that from a doctor, and it's got loads of side effects. One it's of those not, being it's not not for everybody. Again, it's that this is why you want to have that discussion with someone because you want to have that sort of trade off about what your levels are, what's your testosterone, would it be beneficial for you? <laughs> for a lot of guys, it's really really good because it it works. Um, not everyone gets side effects, and then the other thing is if those don't work, it's now hair transplant because they're really good now. Um, I'd say. Great one, Jimmy Carr. Really good hair transplant. Wayne Rooney, not so good, but you know, it's trade off. I have um, I didn't notice. So, well, I'm just celebrities that have had hair transplants. Anyway. Um, but they're they're really successful. So in the in the 80s, we used to do this thing where it's basically um, clumping. Where you take a clump of hair from the back of the head and you stick it on another position, and it looked rubbish. But now you can get this thing called um, what well, it's called flocky, flocky follicular hair transplantation where you take individual follicles and trans and the technology behind it is so good <clears throat> that, that you can take the hair from the back with very little notice at the loss at the back and just transfer it to the front and that's amazing and it works really well so um yeah hair transplants work but they cost and they cost anything from eight to 30 grand yeah they're expensive unless you go to turkey or iran I Iran not, has I got would, good hair uh, hair replacement clinics and Turkey's got good hair replacement clinics. Uh, if you say so. I, I spend a lot of time working in Iraq okay. and, and a lot of the Iraq, see, that part of the world, they, they actually just, you wouldn't think so because it's sort of not a developed country so you wouldn't think they'd be as as um, as concerned or impacted by, you know, marketing to try and sell you um, you know, yeah, look the best you can be and buy our products and blah, 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 whatever. Anyway, they are quite. And they, yeah. the Iraqis used to go to Iran or Turkey to get their hair done. So I would see firsthand the hair transplant uh, hair transplant um, results. Very impressed. I, well, I'm, I'll take you with that. <laughs> <coughs> I would strongly suggest, however, if you're thinking of getting a hair transplant or having any surgical procedure, Not Iran. No? don't go abroad unless you're <laughs> right, happy okay. to pick up the tab when you come back in the UK. As an NHS provider, we will not pick up the cock up if you have a surgical problem abroad Ooh. you will go pay for that explain that explain that i so, didn't know that ah uh, yeah so the thing called so the, we have a gms contract in the nhs which is basically saying this is what we have to treat as part of an nhs provision if you want to have a private procedure that's fine you know you pay have a private procedure but if your private procedure cocks up then that wasn't an nhs procedure so you would have to go somewhere to pay to have that cock up repaired so even in the uk if i go to a XYZ private provider and yeah. I get I don't know 
I don't know what. Oh, I get a hair transplant. Yeah, yeah. And they do it, and yeah. it goes peach on. Yeah. And maybe I get infected, for example, yeah. or something, and I go to the NHS. I'll send gonna... you back. Oh, you can go back to that doctor. He can treat it. Oh, you won't treat me at all? No, I'm not that nice. God, what do I... God. So the NHS won't treat them? It will treat you for a life-threatening problem. So supposing your head went septic and you grew a second brain or something out the back of it and it wasn't good, it was gooey or something weird and it was like life-threatening, then they would treat you. Otherwise, we would be sending you back to the provider to fix that problem. Holy which shit. is difficult if you've had it done in Turkey because... Um, and, and it sounds almost a bit pedantic, but the difficulty is um, you often don't know what's happened in another procedure in another country. Mm. And certainly, you can imagine no A&E doc or GP is going to be familiar with the complexities of what's actually involved in doing the hair transplant procedure. And yet you might come in and go, this has gone all wrong, what do I do? And you go, I don't know. So you wouldn't have to get you back to see a hair transplant surgeon in the UK, which, of course, isn't on the NHS. Hence why you can see, you then have to... So you just have that thing in the back of your head that says it's fine, but if it goes badly you might have to think about how you're going to get that looked at in the uk which means you're going to a private dermatologist got it mm. understood okay while we're on the subject of mm. taking stuff to improve stuff brings us nice on the diet just on the subject of supplementation a minute so testosterone supplements that can improve or increase your testosterone levels let's talk about those yeah w legit or not does stuff like that work no go on <laughs> <laughs> Just not leave it. That's no. easy. Uh, <laughs> there aren't any. There's this idea that you can boost your testosterone, but of course you can't. So um, your body is very good at uh, performing very well in its own environment. We have a thing called homeostasis, which is where your body is always optimizing itself. It doesn't need like a software update like your Apple phone. It just does itself all the time. Um, if your balls are functioning normally, then they already are at their maximum testosterone production. And if you're fit and healthy, nothing you buy over the counter is then suddenly going to make your balls work harder. That doesn't work because it's already optimized. All that will happen is, supposing you said um, zinc is really good and selenium, that will help produce better testosterone. Um, if you were deficient in it, it might. But if you've got normal levels, then it's already. Oh, if you're deficient in zinc or... Or selenium or any other mineral. I'm just... Then if you're deficient and you add them and you replace it back to what it was, then yes, your function gets better because you were missing something. Because you weren't functioning properly in the first exactly. place. But okay. if you're already at maximum function and everything's functioning normally and you have a good diet and your exercise and your lifestyle and you're sexually active, blah, 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 and you're fine, then if you buy this tablet to say it's going to boost it, well, it's not going to because it's already boosted and your body isn't where you can your body will deliberately through a process called negative feedback it will just simply slow it down it'll get to what it wants to do you cannot force it the only way you can force it is to take a medication that will push your testosterone higher which is something from a doctor or the back of a car park from a guy called steve who sells it in a van and you have to inject it and that's probably dodge what's that Test, that's drugs. It's an allergy for drugs. I don't, I don't no, no, no. <laughs> what, what is that that would boost the testosterone in that way? Testosterone. You're taking anabolic steroids. Oh, so, you're, taking a, so you're talking about injecting yourself with testosterone. Yeah. So what I was really getting at through that massively now failed analogy was um, <laughs> the idea is that if you really want to change your testosterone levels, you have to take something that prescribed or a medicine of forms that will actually change the construct and the way that your testicles or your testosterone is produced. If you just want to boost it by buying something you could eat, then it's just not going to work because that's not how your body runs. It's not how your body functions. Um, so, yeah, it's just a total waste of time. There's a lot of things that claim to do this. Um, and there's, there's low, I think one of the biggest ones is tribulus. That's been around for years. Tribulus? Tribulus no. is a, um, a herb that you can buy from various supplement companies that was found in some mice studies in the 70s or <laughs> 80s to produce a small amount of um, testosterone increase in the lab. And it's never been shown to improve testosterone levels in men, ever. But it's still sold as this testosterone booster. How can they get away it. with that? I, I don't know. It seems largely disingenuous. But the other thing is you're, you're selling to a market that's desperate. So if you're, if, you're, if you're a young aspiring athlete and you find something that says it's legal and it could improve your testosterone, you're like, wow, that's amazing. I'll do that. So you try and of course it doesn't do anything um the one that's out at the minute is turkosterone if you've heard of turkosterone it's very popular in the bodybuilding world 
Um, and it's another, it's from a plant, and it's a type of uh, testo synthetic testosterone from a plant. And the, the theory was that this is a, an equivalent to testosterone in men, and if you eat it, it will create a higher level of testosterone in men. But again, it doesn't, and the studies that show it doesn't do an awful lot. But it's once, it, once you can find one study somewhere that said it did something in terms of improving testosterone, then the companies will lick, they'll, they'll grab on that and go, look, this study showed it increased the testosterone, and then we sh market it, and off it goes. And marketing is infinitely more powerful than science. Especially today. Exactly. Especially yeah. today. <laughs> so um, so talking, all these things. Yeah, you you can that. save yourself a lot of money. And the thing is, I, I, honestly, I did the same. When I was 17, 18, I wanted to try anything that would get if I was you know, a young, aspiring, uh, shorter, not very good rugby player, desperately trying to get stronger. I didn't want to take steroids because I valued my testicles. But I thought I want to do something. So you go around the health, the health food shops, you're like, oh, it says boost test. So I'll try that, see if it does anything. And you think maybe it did. But then looking back, of course, it didn't. It's why do steroids cause... Uh, uh, why do steroids c impact um, testosterone production? Um this is a very good question. Why does your penis well, get smaller? If you, allegedly, it's all about what your body reaches its natural limit. So if you have that natural limit of what your body produces, <laughs> I give you testosterone, then your brain goes, "Well, I don't need to produce any more now because I'm having it from somewhere else." So your balls shrink because it doesn't need it anymore. It's that simple. Your body will always do what it wants to a natural level, and then it will either shut down its own production or it will have to compensate by having more testosterone than it needs. But of course, it's not good for you to have more than you need, and that's why things go downhill. Ah, so that's the same as things like people who are long-term drug users. For example, I think cocaine is the classic one, isn't it? We, they, they take that for a long time, and then when they step when they step away from it, like they come clean or whatever, they have all these knock on effects, like a reduction in production of X, Y, Z hormone in the brain. Exactly. And they just fucking they just fucking depressed. And they can't ever get that kick or get happy or get motivated because they were doing it all the time from cocaine before. And the brain went right, shut down the hormone production to make sure. Yeah. Motivated. Exactly right. If you don't need it, I will take the Charlie. So a lot of people that took very high levels of testosterone steroids end up having to be on testosterone replacement because their balls never really recover. My God. So, yeah. My God. Right. Diet. Oh, uh, yeah. Right. So, testosterone yeah. supplements was your Test initial uh, That question. question came from one of the HR patrons, actually. <coughs> yeah, um, I, on my best advice is... Got on Again, oh, sorry, I need sorry. to give me a shout. The question came from Chris. Dark Side Instagram podcast. There you go. Anyway. I can't mention it without no, no, mentioning the podcast. Yeah. But that's his question. Good question. Good it question. Is, it is a very good question because I think it's a massive scam on the the big pharmaceutical sort of, um, supplement agencies because people want to get their testosterone higher, but you don't. You, you can't do it. Mm -hmm. you, you can do things to improve your performance, and uh, there are things that will improve your your ability to train and recover, and things like creatine. You know, it's a really good drug. It's safe. It's got really good evidence base for it, and it's legal. It doesn't affect your testosterone, but it's a great supplement. So why yeah, is it great? For it. Why is creatine great? Because it works. It's, it's so <clears throat> all all creatine really does at a base level is just store water effectively, or allows you to store sugar in the form of water. Um, but you can train harder if you've got more sugar available in your muscle, <clears throat> um, and you can train longer, and your recovery is better. And it does have a good evidence base for showing improvement in performance. But the best thing about it is that it's safe and it's legal. Side effects of creatine? In the short term, water retention. Because at the moment when I'm training, I, tra I take, this is interesting, this because I stay away from creatine. So I, for, I, I have, I'll have protein, a shake, you know, but, but combat fuel, check the combat fuel, veteran owned, okay. Let's give it over the shake today. Very good. Um, yeah, I have a protein shake after I train for muscle recovery. But you're saying creatine aids muscle recovery as well. It really does. It's what about what about? See, I stay away from creatine because I didn't want to put on any excess water. weight that isn't muscle. Yeah, you will put on water weight, but um, but it it still works. You know, if you if you're, <coughs> if you're what, do you, what do you mean water weight? So it, it, as I say, what it's effectively doing when you first start taking creatine, people notice they put on a couple of kilos or maybe a couple of pounds. Sorry. Uh, in every week or two, and that's just stored water initially. That's what it's doing. 
Uh, but within that water, it's stored within the muscle, and then there's sugar, which effectively stores within that, which can be used more quickly in those early stages of exercise. So you don't use creatine if you're a long distance runner, because you'll not that you just won't bother. It'd be a waste of time. You'll weigh more. You'll be heavier. It will slow you down. It won't be useful in short or intermediate sports. Then, then it's useful because it's going to give you that extra little bit of kick to push a little bit harder than you would before. Interesting. Mm. But the big thing is it doesn't have kidney disease associated. I think that was the big worry. of like, oh, do I need to cycle it? Do I need to go off and on and sort of stuff? But the evidence now is it doesn't. And there's some really weird, interesting stuff about improvement in cognitive function in older people. With creatine? With creatine. Really interesting stuff. I'm getting so, off creatine, um, mate. So it's supposed to improve brain function as you get older. So it's, it's a positive thing. So that not everything from the supplement world is rubbish, but it's just you've got sometimes got to do a bit of reading around to see what is really worth it. I'm going to back the combat fuel for some creatine this time. I would. That's. <laughs> you look at my muscle mass. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't... Rugby, rugby, boxing, rugby, boxing, and gym. That's what I do. Yeah, yeah, all that. Be so... Great. Um, I wouldn't, um, wouldn't mix it with anything. So you can get different creatine esters, and you can buy creatine mixed in with sugar. You can buy creatine. Um, they're different types of creatine as well, but basically just the pure, cheap one, creatine monohydrate powder, mix it with something sugary, and off you go. And when you say you wouldn't mix it with anything else, you mean other types of creatine? No, I mean, you can buy it with stuff in it already. So you oh. can buy, like, flavoured creatine, which has sugar in it. And it uh, you don't need to. The be they say that creatine's better absorbed if you have a bit of sugar with it at the same time. And I don't know if that's true, but it's to do with storage, so maybe. Shall I bin off the protein, then, if we're going to do creatine? No, 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 no. Protein's brilliant as well. Okay. Yeah. There is, again, this assumption that too much protein is bad for you. For most people, it probably isn't. Okay. While well, we're on the subject of supplementation and fitness, what about uh, pre-workouts? Because uh, they which are one? fucking crazy. Yeah. I mean, a, a small amount of caffeine or a large amount of caffeine isn't always a bad thing. Um, it's a stimulator. It's a stimulant, sorry. It's going to make you feel like you can train hard. It gives you an energy rush. People are more sensitive. So some people are more sensitive to caffeine than other people. So it depends on who you are. But in general, it's really good. Um, the problem with pre-workouts now is the dose of, of stimulants in them now are getting pretty big and often not particularly safe. So uh, generally, if you're getting arrhythmia, so irregular heartbeats whilst you're training, uh, or have passing out because your blood pressure is so high, that's probably a bad sign. Yeah, I, I, I tried one once, uh, gone from an American store. I was, I was away, I was serving, I was away. I had some downtime, and pre-workout, first day of, I mean, you know sometimes you can look at a substance and think that, that just the, the this texture of it, the look of it looks lethal. Yeah. It looks lethal. Yeah. Um, and in, uh, it's like, right, the, here's the dosage per, per the, or pre workout you should take. Let's say it was, I don't know, a scoop of 50 grams, but it wasn't 50, it was about half of that, I think, like yeah. 20 grams, 25 grams, maybe even less. Anyway, day one, you're supposed to take half. Like the first thing to get take half. Guess what they could did? I don't need to take half. I'm going to take the whole scoop. I did the full scoop, um, went to the gym. And at the time, I was doing loads of weight training. Went to the gym, jumped on a running machine just to warm up. I do five minutes on a running machine just to get my blood going, loosen the body up. And within about three minutes, I was thinking, Jesus Christ, my heart is fucking racing. Yeah, I put my hands on the, um, honest to God, it was mental. To the point you could feel it burst into my chest. I put my hands on the, on the heartbeat sensors on the thing. I was only jogging, mind, 190. So I wasn't, it was like 190 uh, heart rate was, which was, I would hit that. At peak, 190, 200 would be when I was smashing myself in the gym. I was doing it jogging on the treadmill at the start of the workout, and I spent the next hour starfish laid on the floor. I thought I was having a heart attack. I thought I was having a heart attack. I laid down, boom, 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 boom. Crazy, crazy, yeah. And I never went back to pre-workout no, ever yeah. again. Ever yeah. again. I don't know what was in it. I mean, I have a coffee before I go, but that's about as far as I'm pushing it these days. See, I tried that recently before a boxing session, but it was, at, it was the, the session was six in the morning. And I had a coffee with milk, um, and I got the session. I was nearly vomiting. I think just because I had something in my stomach. Yeah, maybe it's that. Yeah, yeah. So I don't I, it's it. individual. I, th there's in theory, there's nothing wrong with a short term use of a pre workout, but because they're all adaptive, so you get used to it very, very What's quickly. What's in them that gets you going? Caffeine. 
Oh, he's a caffeine. There's oh, other okay. stuff you can get for them as well, and, and various different types. I can't remember all of them, but um, caffeine's the core behind it. Yeah, seeing as nowadays you can't legally use amphetamines in them anymore. Um, of course, 25 years ago you could, and things that are famous ones like hydroxyca did have variants of uh, hydroxyca, yeah. amphetamine in, and that would did really it? get you going. Um, <laughs> but of course, <laughs> not legal. So no. Right. Last subject on diet. Um, unless you want to cover anything else. So, processed and unprocessed foods. Question, how can you tell? And Again, people out there may think this is fucking obvious, but I, I, I don't really know. How can you tell, especially when meat's concerned, if it's processed or unprocessed by looking at it? Um, it doesn't tell you on the packet this is processed. I, yeah. for a while, honest to God, my missus despaired. I, for a while, declared, this is three years ago, when I was really starting to get on top of my uh, health diet and all that, and I would... Um, I was smashing bacon twice a day, like bacon and eggs twice a day. I was like, mega, fit, mega, mega healthy. It's good. Just meat, no bullshit. Like, yeah. just nice, good meat. There's some fat in there because I was on about cholesterol at the time. Good fat in there, and mm. blah blah blah. And it's just like you can't, you can't be eating bacon like that. I said, what's the matter? It's just process. It's processed. It's not. Or maybe she didn't say it's processed. It's anyway, probably just massively high in fat. <laughs> I don't probably, know. Yeah. Um, so yeah. there's there's a bit of a a misnomer around what is processed. So when you cook food at home, that's processing. The only thing that's food that's not processed is when you eat it as is. So eating an apple, that's not processed. But cooking is changing the structure of a food and that is therefore making it processed because you are going through a process to change it. What we're really talking about is ultra processing. And ultra processing is where you are changing um, a, a base type of food to make it into something different. So the best example is when you think of stuff like um, vegan burgers, that kind of thing. So if you get a vegan burger, um, the stuff that it's made from might be pea protein or beetroot or something like that. And you've got to make that into something that looks like a chicken nugget or something. Now, obviously, naturally, they don't. So you have to go through this incredibly complex chemical process to make that into something that looks like a burger. Now, that's ultra-processing. And that's when it stops being healthy. Why is that? Because the chemical changes you're having to create. So you imagine that because it's vegan or it's vegetarian, that it's better for you. It's not better, it's different. And that's the point. That you're creating something that has to have so many chemicals and processes added to it that its nutritional value is almost lost. Because eating a pea protein is fine. Turning it into a burger that's filled with artificial flavors salt, stabilizers, fats, whatever you need to do to make it into a burger makes it far less healthy. And even if you didn't use loads of chemicals, you said, well, I've made a really healthy version of this that I've got from the supermarket. Well, um, it, it, it's still not what it was as its original and its nutritional value is still way less. And it's going to be harder to digest because, of course, 99% of it has already been digested once to make it into this burger. So it doesn't have even the same fiber content as if you just ate something from a, a raw process. The other thing we think about processed foods, or what we really mean is ultra processing, is, is stuff like um, uh, like chicken nuggets. That's really good. Say so McDonald's examples or any other chicken nuggets. But um, so to make a chicken nugget, you have to get a bit of chicken and you squeeze it and condense it into a shape that fits a nugget would be. You then have to remember that you've got to do that thousands or hundreds or millions of times. So you want them to be perfect every time. So you have to amend that to make sure that it's always going to taste good. It's going to have a long shelf life so you can distribute it around the world. And you can reheat it and create it in a matter of minutes. And to do that, you've got to add a bucket load of fat. And you've got to add a bucket load of salt and stabilizers to it. Because to do that's the reason it tastes nice. Because if you get a bit of chicken and you boil it and you squish it all together, it doesn't taste that much. That's a good fucking point. That is a good point. Yeah. So it's not that it's not that um, vegan or vegetarian um, ultra processed burgers or anything are particularly good for you. Um, they're certainly not. They're certainly better for you maybe than eating um, a chicken nugget because the fat content will be less. But they're certainly not good for you compared with if you just cook something at home. Hmm. Okay. So unprocessed um, unprocessed foods better. So if you got so so we're we talking about you about the cooking example. Obviously, there's certain stuff you have to cook to eat, but the less the less you are doing to it before it goes into your mouth, the better. Um, well, no, not really, because there is the concept that processing is bad. It doesn't have to be. 
I mean, in general, I want to cook my chicken before I eat it, um, just to avoid salmonella. <laughs> So that processing is good. It's quite good. It's probably saved me various trips to hospital. That's what I mean. The minimum. You but the minimum, you, yeah. yeah. And it's it's not something you ever do at home. So home cooked food, 99% of the time, you can say is going to be always healthier than stuff you buy. If if you, The way to think about it is if the thing you're buying has had to go through a large number of processes to get it to where it is on your plate, then you know that's an unhealthy experience. And the best examples are artificial foods that are created to make something else. Like like pea protein to create a, a meat burger, or there's that kind of one you can get with jackfruit in it, where it has to have beetroot in to make it look like it's got blood in the burger. It's really weird. So they make it look like it's got a burger, but the problem with jackfruit and beetroot is they don't have a lot of taste, and they certainly don't taste like a burger. So then you have to add salt and fat to make it taste nice. And again, you're back to where you were with the whole nugget scenario. So the more you do to it, the less healthy it's going to be. But the big caveat that is. I, I take my kids to McDonald's. I, I don't go to McDonald's because I'm eating a salad. I expect it to be unhealthy, but I know it's unhealthy. So as long as you're not naive enough to go in and go, well, I'm, I'm training up for my next marathon, I'm going to whack in those nuggets, then then you're fine. It's just it's understanding the concept. And it doesn't matter if it's once in a while. Everything in moderation, including yeah. moderation, right? Exactly. I fucking love McDonald's. I love McDonald's. I prefer Burger King burgers. Fair enough. Burger King Burger King burgers with McDonald's fries. If there was a place that sold, did that, that would, they'd, be, they'd make a killing off me. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, right, diet, diet. Anything else you want to cover on diet? What, what's your key advice is generally with diet? Uh, avoid keto diets. They irritate me. Um, Why? Because uh, they're disingenuous, I think. Go on. Uh, so, so keto diets, the idea that you cut, I mean, it's always very contentious stuff when you say a phrase like that, isn't it? But so in theory, keto diet, you're cutting out carbs, right? And this is what keto diets are supposed to be. They make you ketogenic so that you are supposed to be burning up your fat. So it's healthier. Um, and it's a variant of the Atkins diet whereby you have very high saturated, so very high <coughs> fat content, very minimal carbohydrate, and you're relying on your meats and vegetables to get everything in. Um, but actually, that isn't what real ketogenesis is. So ketogenic diets really came out of the 1920s and 30s where they found that kids that were epileptic uh, if you completely took out all carbohydrate, and I mean every bit of carbohydrate from their diet, it decreased their seizure activity. Um, but it's miserable. It's miserable as hell. And the big thing is your brain needs carbohydrates. Your brain needs glucose constantly to supply. Um, and the way that the modified version of ketogenic diets work now is very few people are truly completely keto free. They have some carbs. They just have less carbs. But if you imagine actually cutting out every bit of carbohydrate in your diet, so like there's not even any milk in your coffee or tea, um, there's no fruit because of course it's carbohydrate, it's just, it's just um, fats and protein. Um, not only does it taste horrible, but um, I, you just reduce your calorie content and that's all it's really doing. So when we say you're on a keto, what you're really doing is just eating less over a month period. And if you look at the calorie content, they say, well, I'm, I'm eating more because I'm having fats, but actually... It's not sustainable in that way. And over a month period or two month period, you'll find actually the way it works is you've just eaten less food. And, and that's how it works. So I don't mind you calling it ketogenic, but it's not really ketogenic. It's a very low carbohydrate diet. It's also not a sustainable one. So uh, no. the, this is uh, my, what, the biggest thing I've learned over the last few years is just to become, you know, as you get older, we can become more aware of ourselves. We get more worried. So you like, yeah, okay, yeah. need to start paying attention because I haven't done it for the last four years. <laughs> I can start doing it now. Um, is on the diet front is I think it's much more, it's much more, you're much better off. Let's say you want to lose, let's say you want to lose weight and everyone wants to lose it like that really quick. And, a ketogenic diet, Atkins diet, over two weeks, you're going to lose it like yeah, that yeah. quick. It's not a sustainable diet. You can't keep doing it. Like many of the diets, are, it's not sustainable to keep on doing all the way through. So you're much better off, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Jeff, is, is sacrificing a bit of uh, like emotional investment in how quick you want to lose the weight. Say, okay, I'm willing, to, I'm willing to take a bit longer to lose the weight but doing it with a sustainable diet, which I can do all the time. And, I'm, and that's going to get me down to a healthy weight limit. And the way I, so the way I do that is, like, like you were saying there, I try and eat healthy most of the time. I don't set myself rules like, I'm never going to eat sugar. I'm never going to eat McDonald's. No, fucking no. I'm going to 
try and eat healthy most of the time. I'm really conscious about when I go, most of the time, when I go to the supermarket, I'm conscious about what I buy. If I buy a snack or whatever, it's, it's like when I got the kids over, I'm going to get snacks, I'll, I'll know, okay, I'm buying this, like screwing up when you're eating these. And then I'm, cause I know I'm not buying it the rest of the time. So you can have, it's like, it's like having cheat days, but you're not allocating yourself. Oh, Sunday's my cheat day. Cause you're going to break the, you're going to break the habit. Cause Wednesday you're going to get out for dinner. You can't, you're not going to say no or a beer or whatever. You go, no, I can't, I only drink beers on Sundays. It's like sustainable, you know, <laughs> try and eat healthy most of the time. Occasionally you're going to slip outside your own rules, but you know you are, so that's fine. Just don't do it all the time. Don't do it all of the time. Except that doesn't sell books. If you want to make money <laughs> as, a, as a nutritionist, you need to come up with a handle. Hang on, I haven't written a book. It might do. I might write that. This is the whole point. You are entirely right. And the key of this is spot on. But the problem is that's not sexy dietitian work, is it? You know, if you want to, you need a handle. You need something that will grasp you. And if you're a yo-yo dieter and you're desperate to lose a bit of weight, you want to find a quick book and it says, oh, lose three stone in 80 days. Brilliant. I'll do that by cutting out carbs. You've got your answer. But obviously it's... No. Not common. Anyway. Why did you write the book? Why? Uh, because men are not great at engaging in health. And as ex- discussed by today, things like erectile dysfunction, uh, blokes have it. They don't want to talk about it. Testosterone is something that blokes don't even know that they need to talk about. And reaching a male health audience is difficult. I still get patients that come in and, and they boast. They go, oh, I've not seen a doctor for 20 years. As if that's like something to be uh, proud of. And I go, no, that's that's awful. That's why you've got diabetes. <laughs> and they go, oh, I, yeah, I should have come a bit earlier. So this was a way to try and reach a bigger audience without necessarily them going, oh, we need to see a doctor. And maybe it was like a more slightly lighthearted way in some cases. And you could say, oh, maybe this isn't. And hopefully we can get men to think about health a bit better. Yeah, I like me. I like you know. I read the book since before. I've read the book. I think it's a fucking brilliant book. Genuinely do. Thank you. Also, I think that. Uh, it's an important one for spouses, girlfriends, mm. fiancés, wives to read. I genuinely do because you want to be more aware of of what could be causing issues in your in your fella. I generally think that. Generally think that. In the same way, in that you know, there's a. I do talk a lot about mental health. In the same way that you don't just want the people who have mental health problems or illness to be aware of mental health causes symptoms and all of that you want the people around them to be right yeah yeah totally thank you jeff oster man alive is the book it's on i read it on kindle it's on um oh, it's on every yeah it's on amazon it's uh, yeah you can get it in waterstones yeah it's good yeah quite lucky great book thank and you. how can people follow you uh you can follow my uh uh, Twitter or my Instagram and you just type in Dr. Jeff Foster and it's D-R-J-E-F-F and there's another F and then O-S-T-E-R Dr. Jeff Foster Excellent Mate it's been an absolute pleasure Thank really you. really interesting really useful and I'm sure that your advice today is going to help a lot of people I hope so Thank you Cheers mate That's it Thank you for watching the H Hour podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast and you haven't already done so, please subscribe here around about there. I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear if not, if it's not already appeared. Uh, you can also, um, if you want to listen to the podcast on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Google Podcasts. It's everywhere. It's on all of the, uh, all of the common and not so common podcast apps. You can also, if you wish to do it, become a patron of H-Hour. Becoming a patron of H-Hour, you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else. So this interview with this guest was released days, if not weeks, before it was on release to the general public. And you also get access to uh, exclusive interviews, which I do with each guest, that last about five, ten minutes, that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of H-Hour have chosen. And each guest, this one included, gets asked those questions before the main podcast that's getting recorded. It's like a pre-podcast interview, lasts about ten minutes. And those interviews are really insightful, really enjoyable, nice and short, and they only release to patrons. They never get released to the public. I don't know why I had a little stutter there. Um, you also get access to... A Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. 
In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away give away gifts to my Patreon supporters, and it's all like well, predominantly veteran-owned stuff. I'll go and buy veteran-owned apparel, veteran-owned product services, and I'll give them away to my Patreon supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events, so you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of Page Hour, go to patreon.com forward slash HK podcast. I'm spelling Patreon, P A T R E O N. Patreon.com forward slash HK podcasts. Hit become a patron. And uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom, Q- Zoom QA if you do. Oh, you also get your name in the credits. Thanks for watching. I will catch you next time.